I'm Rob Lathuria, Senior Editor at Dial Doobie. I'm here with the one, the only Jonathan Murray, co-founder of Vian and Murray Productions, who are responsible for so many iconic reality series, series that we've seen over the past few decades. And um, today I'm here to talk to Jonathan um, about the latest iteration of The Real World, which is called Real World's Homecoming New York. First of all, Jonathan, before we do that, um, I'm sure people always say this to you, but you really are literally the OG producer of this whole genre. And before it was even a thing, um, what does that feel like? Is it is it a vindication or pride? Like, how do you feel about that? What you see now on TV is something that you spearheaded many, many, many years ago. Well, uh, you know, I take neither the credit nor the blame. <laughs> um, you know, when my, my uh, late partner, Mary Ellis Bunum and, I, Bunum and I got together, it was, you know, she was out of daytime soaps. I was out of news and documentary. You put those two together and you sort of get this very commercial form of the documentary where you're going out and you're casting the seven people to live together. You're art directing the loft they're going to live together. Um, but still believing that by putting those people together, you could still get at some of the big truths, you know, that that when they come together, those conversations will take us into places that maybe we wouldn't normally go to. So um, I'm proud of what we've done as a company um, and uh, this opportunity to do Real World Homecoming was you know, a big full, full circle moment for all of us and uh, really made us uh, have a better sense of the impact of the show. Yeah, let, let's talk about Homecoming New York because for many of us that watched the original, I mean, it was such a long time ago and we were, it was such a different world and we were all so, such different people, which obviously means <clears throat> the people on the show were extremely different as well. Um, the show contemplates how our culture has changed over the years really beautifully and also how reality TV itself has morphed and evolved. So was that the main outcome you wanted to get out of this reunion series? Yeah, we wanted to um, take a look at um, the impact of this social experiment on these seven individuals, but we also wanted to sort of take measure of our own contribution to that and you know, the good and the bad of it, how, you know, and, and what we've learned over the years. So, um, you know, we, we, when we started to think about doing this, we started thinking about the movie Big Chill, you know, this idea of friends coming back together. Um, and we wanted to very much have a story that lived in the present, wasn't just reflecting on the past. Um, so those were our goals and, and we're pretty happy with the way it came out. Yeah, it didn't actually spend way too much time on the nostalgic element. It certainly was part of it, which I thought was really quite uh, rewarding for us, the viewer. But it really did focus on where these people are at now and where we are at now on a more macro level. Did anything surprise you? Because as the producer, you know, you've got it all mapped out. You think you know how it's going to turn out. But what did surprise you? Well, I think how immediately comfortable everyone was with each other. I mean, these relationships, you know, and, and they've all sort of, a lot of them have seen each other, but they haven't been together as a group, um, all seven of them. Um, so I think what surprised me was how quickly they fell back into their friendships and comfort level of living with each other. I mean, uh, part of the excitement of doing this, this, particular season, the first season, is that there really was a genuine connection and love between those cast members. They really are a family. And even though they disagree, even though they squabble, um, uh, the, at, the, at the center of it is, is a lot of love. So when you're casting a show like Real World and, and some of the others that you've been involved in, not I mean, and you're not the casting director per se, but of course you have a lot of input in what the show is going to look like. Do you appreciate now, particularly these days, the responsibility that you and your team have to spotlight diversity among cast and crew um, when it comes to race and gender, sexuality and ethnicity? Does that, is that a really now important factor for you? That was important to us from the very beginning um, because the basic idea of the real world is you put seven 
people together from different backgrounds, different races, different sexual orientation, different socioeconomic levels, um, they're going to make mistakes with each other. They're not used to living with people different from themselves. We all grow up in our little silos. And those mistakes will result in conflict. And that conflict will be our story arc. You know, that conflict and the growth that comes from it will be our story arc. So for us, from the beginning, we felt for the real world, diversity was very important. And it was interesting to see how, as other shows came along later, Survivor, eight years later, you know, diversity. Richard Hatch wins the first season as a gay Machiavellian guy. Um, yeah. No one would have scripted that. It comes out of reality, being willing to put those people together and just see what happens. Yeah, and finding the right mix of people and, uh, and then watching them just go. Uh, so that, that brings me to this. What do you, is there a, 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 an archetype for the best kind of reality TV character, or is it obviously a much more complicated process than that? Well, it's more complicated. When we look for people, we look for people who are who have enough of a per, en, enough of a character that's clear who they are. Um, they can't be too fuzzy. You sort of have to get who they are fairly quickly. But we also want people who are open to change, open to being influenced by people around them. We don't want them so set that they're just gonna never change because for us, particularly the real world where there's no competition, part of the story is how these people evolve, how they change. So they have to be open to change. Um, and then of course you look for, you know, great sense of humor. You look for people who are very good at expressing themselves. Um, people who are unfiltered, who are comfortable expressing themselves, not going to edit themselves. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it. And, and, you know, you may be looking for something, but then someone walks in the door that you hadn't thought about and it's a no brainer. They're great. Yeah. And then of course, with some of your other shows, um, it, obviously the talent like Project Runway, you know, you bring people in that are just mind-bogglingly talented um, and giving them a shot at maybe you know a career in the industry and then you have other shows like a road rules and the challenge um, where you're just uh, spotlighting these people with really um, either really great social skills or the, these people on the challenge I just every time I watch it I, I pull a muscle just from watching it uh, so I just like also wonder um, when when you're when you're um, getting involved in a show like Project Runway, it's a show that you've been nominated at the Emmys for a few times, and it's it's been such a popular success. What's the most what's the most rewarding part of Project Runway? Is it giving people a shot, or is it um, the ability to be immersed in this world where people are creating these extravagant costumes and designs? It's really both. Project Runway was really the first show that really um, went out and sort of put a spotlight on people with talent. Um, mm. And, um, you know, and it's interesting to watch as these different individuals come together and are tested in a way that, you know, um, they couldn't imagine how, how much pressure they're under. And of course, then you have Tim Gunn, who was always the person who his first and foremost concern was, was, was the contestants and their well-being and how they were. He wasn't so worried about the show. He was worried about them, which I think is remarkable. Um, but yeah, it was a, uh, it was, uh, we didn't create the show, but we had the honor to produce it for 11 seasons. Um, and it was nominated for an Emmy for every one of those seasons. But um, uh, it's a beautiful format. It's a really brilliant format and it has stood the test of time and it has been much copied by other people. I know there are so many different versions of that show now and there are people who are creating like god knows what else uh and it's just so funny that people are trying to constantly replicate the success of a show like that and also a show like uh, road rules and real world the original show where you just kind of observe people um in, at their highest and lowest moments is there ever a moment that you can think of this may be difficult because there's so much to choose from where you look back and it was something that was just so profoundly either moving, disturbing or exhilarating that you always kind of go to as a story when people ask you about your, your history on real world? 
Well, it's not so much something that I go to when people ask about it, but certainly um, it, it was incredibly powerful. Uh, and that was when Pedro Zamora in season three of The Real World, uh, we were had cameras with, with him when he found out just how low his T-cell count was. And the T-cell count sort of measures your strength of your immune system. And his was just rock bottom, which meant that he was very much open to opportunistic infections. And, 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 and it was um, the beginning of a very treacherous period for his health. Um, and I remember him coming out of the doctor's office after he was told that and our producer just pulled him aside and hugged him and said, you know, it, what can we do? Uh, do you want us to take the cameras off you? You know, uh, but he wanted us to keep filming. Yeah, I, you know, I forgot about that moment. I remember it well. It's just this great example of when we are that fly on the wall in a very intimate, personal moment. Um, it's, there's really nothing like that actually on on TV. And that brings me to this, it's like the complete opposite. Uh, something like Keeping Up With The Kardashians, another show that I mean, I'm kind of going through all your greatest hits, but do, did you ever appreciate that that show, how that show has influenced pop culture? Like this, it's, I can't even put it into words. I've never actually seen an episode to be completely honest with you, but pretty much every person in my life just watches it religiously. Uh, what, 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 did you have any idea that that would be the show that it became? I don't think you ever do when you're, when you're doing anything. Um, and the odds are always against you. Uh, it always takes the perfect confluence of the right talent, the right format, the right network, the right month and day that it happens to go on the air. Um, there's just so many things involved. Um, but what made the Kardashians unique uh, was that um, they, when I first saw video of them, they were like a ready-made sitcom. You had the, the mom who was managing everybody's careers. You had the dad who was like, oh my God, these people are crazy. Um, and you had the three beautiful sisters, each unique. Uh, and you had the two younger sisters and you had the brother. I mean, it, it it was clear there was something there. And, you know, I always love, as opposed to shows like Real Housewives, I love something like the Kardashians because it's a real family. And so as much as they might disagree or as big an argument they can get into, ultimately they are family. So they're going to have to work through it and come back together. And I think that was part of the power of it. And yes, um, most of us don't live, live our lives like they're Kardashians, but, you know, at the core, they're not that different from us. Yeah, I think that's the key. And that's what I'm always told about them. Um, and it's not that I don't watch it for any reason. It's just that I can't watch everything. I'd never sleep. Um, the other thing that uh, really fascinates me now in this day and age, and we were talking about the pandemic offline, obviously, because everyone does. It's just hit, uh, hit everyone so profoundly. What is the future of reality TV, particularly for you and your production company, in the age of the pandemic and coming out of that? Well, I don't directly run the company anymore. I'm a consultant yeah. to it, but yeah. uh, Julie Peasy and her team um, really used the pandemic to um, uh, work on a lot of ideas, a lot of development. They sold a lot of uh, shows during uh, the pandemic and those are starting to now go into production. Um, we even did a few, obviously like like uh, Homecoming uh, and like The Challenge, we were able to make some shows during the pandemic. But, uh, you know, I think there's, um, you know, reality has just so mushroomed in terms of the different subgenres. Um, something we're really interested in is the uh, comedy, um, a reality that has, uh, has humor attached to it. We did that with The Simple Life many years ago. And I think we're trying to explore that again um, because you know a lot of people, lives are challenging enough that they, they do wanna be entertained when they get home. So um, finding those characters who are entertaining and enjoyable to watch and just get lost in their lives. Uh, or in some kind of a format that that makes you smile or laugh is is something I think that uh, we're all searching for. 
Yeah, I think that's key, actually. We do need either super escapism or something that's going to make us laugh out loud. I'm kind of always desperately looking for that on, on my TV screens. Um, and, and like something like The Challenge, for example, yeah, you were able, that, that show was able to be so well done in Iceland under very strict COVID regulations with the most incredibly um, elaborate sets and designs and, and um, obstacles and so forth. Like, it's a real testament to the many, many people that, are, that operate all of these shows that you've had a hand in shepherding. And how does that make you feel? And do you, uh, do you keep up with all of them? Like, ha- what is your day-to-day role in all of this, um, like, empire? Yeah, um, it used to be um, until maybe six or seven years ago, I watched every cut of every show that came through Buda Murray. And um, finally, I, I just had to step back because I needed more balance in my life. And quite honestly, we have an incredible team and they were certainly ready to take up that challenge of of, of the quality control, making sure everything was done well. Um, So now I'm able to, you know, have a more balanced life, but it was great. I mean, I loved it, but it was, you know, pretty much 30 to 35 years of just nonstop um, cuts to watch. Yeah. It's exhausting, but I guess, you know, that was your baby. And um, I mean, it's pretty cool that you're able to step back a little and trust the people that you know that have be, that have come into the fold to look after it because it's all done so well. The challenge, for example, is like is a blockbuster. It is so popular, um, and yet for some reason it still has not broken through at the Emmys. Like it's actually so frustrating to me that a show like that um, and and the real world has not yet broken really broken through at the Emmys. I really hope it does this year. Um, does that something that um, ever plays on your mind? Would you like to see that happen? Obviously. Yeah, I mean, obviously I would because there's so many um, wonderful people who work on these shows. I mean, the craft level of, of the editors, of the camera people, of audio technicians, um, the production designers. I mean, there's so many people who are just very good at what they do. And I think, you know, when the real world started in 92, there really wasn't a category for us in the Emmys. You know, I think we would have been up against a Bill Moyers special and Bill Moyers was a newsman on PBS. Um, uh, And then as when they finally started to get some of these categories in the 2000s, we had been on the air for 10, 12 years. And I think by then we were sort of old news. And I also think that a lot of the Emmy voters tend to be people in their 40s and 50s. And, you know, real world and the challenge were considered youth, youth television. So I'm not even sure they were watching them or aware of them. Um, you know, we certainly always felt that with the people who wrote about television were generally, you know, white guys in their 40s who ne- wouldn't necessarily get a show like The Real World. Yeah, I think that's probably key. And, uh, and yet, and, you know, still you've done quite well at the Emmys. So l- let's just go through a bit of that because we're Gold Derby and that's what we live for. Um, so you won, you've won two or three competitive Emmys. I, I, I think it's three. Um, I mean, yeah, there's um, one of them was, uh, 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 one of them was a daytime Emmy. That's uh, right. For, for starting over. Which, that's uh, right. And like, we, we, don't, we don't look down on the daytimes. They're, they're just as great as the prime time. The statues but look the same, I will tell the you. The statues look the same. They're, they're up there. If you can oh, see wow. two of them, there's two more. Oops, I can't quite. See. Two more over oh, there. Oh, yeah. You can see yeah. The four, there's four Emmys. Very good. It's so, they're so cool. I love that statue. It's so, it looks so dangerous. You can always get up there if someone you know, wants you to have to be very careful. But I think, you know, the Emmy that I think I was, that we were all most excited about winning was the Emmy for Born This Way. Um, yeah. It was in the new unstructured reality category. Um, and, you know, that show probably, uh, you know, after the real world has brought me the most satisfaction and joy in terms of its impact, uh, uh, you know, on those people who watched it. So that was pretty exciting. And then, um, well, then another Emmy is for um, Autism the Musical. Yes. Documentary right, we did. That was a primetime Emmy. Um, oh, and the, the fourth Emmy was another daytime one. It was for um, Valerie's 
uh, home cooking, uh, a, a cooking show with Valerie Bertinelli. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so cool. So so varied. Um, but speaking of the Emmys, you were inducted into the Hall of Fame a few years ago with um, Mary Ellis, obviously the late Mary Ellis Bunham. Um, you accepted that huge honour with her daughter. It's a really great speech. And I really loved how you talked about how you were kind of like the, at the adults table because, you know, that, you know, the narrative people are always looked looked up at and the reality people are always a slightly, which is just, you know, not the case these days. I think mo most people watch reality and not narrative and it's so hard for narrative to actually become successful. But what was, what did that mean to you? I mean, obviously you were super proud and excited, but when you look back at being inducted, what comes to mind? Yeah, it was, um, it made me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> I think it probably happened uh, uh, maybe sooner than it should have. I don't know. But because um, I still had, I hadn't done Born This Way. I still had a lot of other things I wanted to do. Um, but it was an honor. I mean, I'm a kid who grew up uh, cutting up the TV guide uh, when I was 10 years old and reprogramming the networks. I even got the TV guide to send me the ratings because they weren't being published at that point. So I was very much a child of television, desperately wanted to get into television, didn't know how you get into television. So I ended up going to journalism school and going into uh, broadcast news on the local level and working my way up and then finally transitioning to programming. Um, so yeah, it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's nice when you get the honors before you're dead, I guess. <laughs> That's right. At least they didn't wait until, you know, you, you, you had both passed. It was so sad <clears throat> many years ago when Mary Ellis passed yeah. away. Um, you know, also, I, I think back to, you, I was just thinking, you know, you get the Lifetime Achievement Awards or you get inducted and you think, oh, is that, does that mean I'm done? But I mean, you had so much more to do and you obviously still do. And you're also serving as vice chair for people who don't know um, of the Television Academy Foundation. So the, you're so entrenched in the industry and in the, in the academy. What is actually going to be next for you? Are you going to continue bringing out these fantastic real world, world series? What, what are you planning? Um, well, uh, the response to Real World Homecoming was so great, um, both critically and in terms of viewership, that uh, I think we're headed towards doing another one. It's not finalized, but I think it looks good. Um, have to figure out which cast to do and uh, uh, all of that. Um, so we'd like to do that because we do feel that there's, um, it proved that there's some, that, that there's a value in going back and looking at it and that this, this format we came up of, of bringing the cast back together to live together, not just to sit on a stage with a host, that there's something powerful in it. So yeah, we'd like to do that again. Um, I have a few shows I developed during COVID that uh, are in various stages of development. One of them is I'm, you know, turned everything in casting and hoping it'll get a green light. Um, so yeah, so, uh, and then I have some outside of television, I'm developing some theater and uh, uh, working on some other projects. So again, I have a little more balance in my life. Just came in from the garden, my hands are super dirty. <laughs> you have a bit more balance, but it still seems like you're super busy. And um, John, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure having you um, on at Gold Derby. And also thanks for your incredible work over the decades. You've, you've added so much to so many people's lives. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation.